So in the last video, I did a similar example to the one you see on the screen right now to find the current through the resistor. In this video, I'd like to do this example several different ways so that we can see how KVL works uh, inside of a circuit. You may have noticed in the last video that I just made an assumption about the polarity of the voltage on the resistor. In this video, I'm going to show you what happens when you don't make that assumption. We're also going to look for the power in the resistor to show that the power calculations we developed in the very beginning can still be used in actual circuits. So let's get started. The first thing I'm going to do is not assume that there's any particular polarity whatsoever on the resistor. I'm just going to call this VR. I don't know where positive is, I don't know where negative is, so I won't make any assumptions. KVL says the voltage around a closed loop must be zero, specifically the sum of the voltages. So KVL says 10 volts plus VR has to equal to zero. Implicitly, <clears throat> what that means is that there's a negative and a positive. This terminal is assumed to be at a higher voltage. So we've implicitly made that assumption even though we haven't stated it just because of how KVL works. But let's take a look now if we solve for VR. Well, this would imply that VR is actually negative 10 volts. What does that mean? If I'm entering, my current is entering the terminal that I assume to be negative, it means that I am going from this potential to this one negative 10 volts. So this drop is negative 10 volts, which means this drop, or this voltage change, I'm sorry, is positive 10 volts. Remember, when you get a negative, you flip the sign and you also flip the direction of the arrow. Let's zoom in on that resistor then. If this is positive 10 volts, that means that this terminal is actually at a higher potential than this one, which means that my assumed polarities were incorrect. But that's okay. All I need to do is flip them. I'm going to redraw the circuit with everything flipped over. So before I do that, oh, I don't want to flip that. This is what we got. We had a negative and a positive and negative 10 volts. This is what we found. This circuit now, because we've done the analysis, should be drawn as follows. This voltage source doesn't change. This all does. The negative moves up, the arrow switches direction, and the negative sign goes away. Positive, negative, arrow is that way, 10 volts. That was method number one. To recap it, I didn't make any assumption about the polarity of the resistor. I just used KVL, which said the sum of the voltages around a closed loop must be zero. So I added them all together. Solving for VR gave me a negative number. That meant that the assumption that was implicit in KVL, specifically that the negative terminal or the lower potential terminal of the resistor was on top, was incorrect. But that's okay. It wasn't that I was wrong, it's that I didn't know in the first place. So all I had to do was redraw my circuit with everything flipped over on the resistor, and I'm done. Let's do this in a different way. Parallel. So, like we said, things that are in parallel share a voltage. This is what I did last time. If we have a voltage source of 10 volts, and my resistor here shares both terminals, top and bottom, that means that R and my voltage source are in parallel. And I'm going to introduce a shorthand. Parallel is two parallel lines. It's just easier to write. Since I'm going to be using this shorthand a lot, I'll just explain in the video. Parallel is two parallel lines. Therefore, VR has to equal to 10 volts with the same polarity as my voltage source, which means the 
right? This is the negative terminal, the low potential terminal, this is the high potential terminal, and this is my 10 volt. This explains why I call it a voltage drop. If you consider current moving this way in the circuit, it enters in the positive or the high potential terminal and goes down 10 volts. If current were going the other way, then it would go up 10 volts and it would be a voltage rise. Now the question is, what is the current in the resistor? So we've made the assumption above and now we've solved the problem here of what the polarity of the voltage is in the resistor. But couldn't the current be going this way? Couldn't it be undergoing a voltage rise in the resistor? Remember Ohm's law. When we first introduced resistors, we said that positive current always enters the positive terminal. The reason that we said that was because resistors always absorb energy. As a result, the current must be entering this way. So, what is that current? Well, V is equal to I times R, or I is V over R. I said that my resistor was a 1 ohm resistor. My voltage source is 10 volts. Therefore, my current is 10 amps. To give you an idea of how much current this is, keep in mind that most homes, most homes that have a uh, breaker box, this is to protect the home from having too much current. Every circuit in the home is only capable of handling about 15 amps. Some of them can be double. So 10 amps is quite a bit of current. The final question we need to answer is, what is the power through the resistor? Remember that power is V times I times the sine. In our case, we have positive current entering positive terminal. So sine is positive 1. Voltage is 10 volts, and current is 10 amps. Therefore, the power in my resistor is 10 times 10, or 100 watts. This is also quite a bit of power. If you remember, there were light bulbs that used to be about 100 watts. Nowadays, we use LED light bulbs, and they can be as low as 4 watts. So 100 watts is quite a bit of power to be using in one resistor. Now, oftentimes our resistors are given in terms of a specification of how much power they can actually handle. Very, very common ones we'll see in the lab are 1 quarter watt resistors and 1 half watt resistors. If we were to try to put 10 volts across a 1 ohm resistor that can only handle 1 half a watt, it would be damaged quite severely. When you're connecting things in the lab, it's important to understand the power that's flowing through your circuit before you turn the power on. That's one of the reasons we use circuit analysis. If your analysis indicates that your power is going to be significantly higher than what your components can handle, you need to look again at your circuit and try to redo your analysis. Perhaps you need to redesign your circuit. Let's take a look at an example of when we might be able to do this. Remember that when we talked about circuits in general, there were sources, there were sinks, remember that sinks used energy, and there was control. This control is the interface between the source and the sink to make it possible for the sink to use the energy that it can. What do I mean by this? Well. Let's take a look at that simple circuit that we've been using. One voltage source and one resistor. The problem is that if this is a one ohm resistor, but it's a one half watt resistor, then we have an issue. What we cannot do is connect this circuit directly. So what we need to do is install another resistor here. 
this resistor will be a control resistor. One of the most difficult parts of circuit design is choosing the values of the components that are appropriate. So, let's do a little bit of analysis. The question we want to answer is, what is the minimum value of the control resistor? Or better, the control resistor. So what do I mean by this? What is the minimum value? Well, if you take a look at this circuit, you might say that if I can only have one half of one watt going through this resistor, then that might tell me that I have only a certain amount of voltage and current that can go through it. But what that voltage and current are at the moment, we just don't know. But let's see if we can figure that out. If V equals to IR through that resistor, and the power through the resistor is V times the current through that resistor, but P equals to VI, so if I substitute this expression here in here, then I might say that the power through the resistor is I times R times I. We're multiplying by the sign, but remember the sign through the resistor is always positive one so I'm not going to keep it in here, or I squared times R. Now we can start solving the maximum power the resistor can have is one half of one watt. The resistance was one ohm. So what we're really looking for is the maximum current if we plug everything in and we solve for i, 1 over the square root of 2. It's not a very nice number, but it'll work. So now what are we going to do? Let's redraw the circuit with that unknown resistor in there. Remember that's 10 volts. This is called RC, the control resistor. And this is 1 ohm. And importantly, we're going to put a current, I, is 1 over root 2. But how do we proceed now? We want to solve for RC. We need this. Each of these has a voltage drop across them. This is going to be called VC, just to avoid saying VRC. And this is going to be called VR, the drop across that known resistor. Let's use KVL and see what happens. Going in this direction, I have 10 volts. And remember, we're going to have the polarity as plus and minus and plus and minus. So we're actually going to be subtracting VC and subtracting VR. Minus VC minus VR equals to 0. That's what KVL tells us. Now, we don't actually have two unknowns in this equation, because we know that VR, this is the maximum VR we're allowed, is going to be this current we figured out, 1 over root 2, multiplied by that resistance, which is 1. So now we can go ahead and plug that in. We have 10 volts minus the unknown VC minus 1 over root 2 equals to 0. Or, when we solve for it, Vc equals to 10 minus 1 over root 2. I'm going to leave this as a fraction just for now. Now, how does that help us? Well, we know Ohm's law. So, by Ohm's law, Vc equals to I RC. We know this is given here. We know this. Its maximum is 1 over root 2, so we can solve for RC. 
I think it's a good idea at this point to turn this into a decimal. So 10 minus 1 over root 2 is approximately 9.3. So, we have 9.3, which is equal to, and 1 over root 2 is 0. Points, 0 0.7071 times RC. So we can solve that RC is equal to 13.15 ohms. Remember, this represents the minimum value that we need to prevent damage to the 1 ohm resistor. So this was a rather long video, and we went through a lot. But really, it was just one big example that we went through. The first thing we talked about was how do you know what the polarity of the voltage is? It turns out it doesn't really matter. As long as you make an appropriate assumption and you carry it through, then at the end, if you get negative numbers, you just flip things around. The next thing that we did was we said, what happens if we want to actually use this information to design a circuit? And that took quite a while. We first needed to ask ourselves, what kind of design do we want? Since all we know about right now are resistors and voltage sources, it made sense to put everything as a resistor and a voltage source. Then, we had to turn a specification, which was given in terms of power, into a specification in terms of a resistance. The process by which we did that was not simple. If you found yourself a little bit lost, that's okay. This is your first introduction to circuit design, and circuit design is a very big field. Throughout the rest of this course, We'll be doing a number of examples very, very similar to that. Thank you.